Welcome to this video and in this video I wanted to discuss how we actually calculate the density of exoplanets. Now it requires a few different observations in order to get the actual density. So the first thing we actually need to do is we need to find the mass and the volume and then we can calculate the density. Now it's worth noting at this point that not all exoplanets have their density calculated. So if you go on the exoplanet archive, you can get lots of different plots that are pre-generated of all different parameters of the planets that have been discovered so far. And this one here just shows you the density against the mass in Jupiter masses. And it's not a large collection of planets, so not every single planet has their density calculated. And the reason for that is you need to be able to, to calculate or find the mass and also to find the volume. And it's not possible to calculate both of those from all planets. Normally you get one or the other, depending on the detection method. If you can get both detection methods at the same time, then you're able to get the density. So let's start with the volume. So the volume, we're going to assume that the planets are spherical. Now they're not absolutely perfect. They're not spherical, they're slightly non-spherical in shape, but we make the assumption that they're going to be spherical because it will give us a good approximation at least. And the volume for a sphere is given here. So it's four over three times pi r cubed. And the thing we can actually measure and calculate is going to be the radius of the planet. So that's what we need to find from our observation first to get the volume. So the way that's calculated is using the transit method. So if you have a planet and it's orientated such that it passes in front of its star as it orbits it, then we can see a dip in the brightness of that star. So we can't actually measure the planet, but what we can measure is how bright the star is. So that planet passes in front, it blocks out some light. The bigger the planet, the bigger the dip in brightness. So that's how we get the size of the planet. So here's the equation and our delta F is the change in the brightness. So actually it's normally referred to as flux and it's normally normalized to the, the general brightness of the star. So you'll see that on the y-axis, the normalized flux is one and your delta f the depth for that is how much it changes in brightness as the planet passes in front basically and the equation is essentially just the area of one circle take away the area of another one and that's the change in brightness basically so it's fairly straightforward there's a little bit more to it and complex if you want to go into more detail but we can get the basic radius of the planet here so our delta f our change in brightness is approximately equal to the radius squared of the planet over the radius squared of the star. And we can rewrite it like this here actually. So if we want the radius of the planet, then it's the radius of the star times the square root of the change in flux, the delta f. Now, the radius of the star, we would have calculated that from a different method. So I've done another video where we look at how we calculate the radius of the star, which you can have a look at. So normally you'd already have that in a catalog that would already be calculated from a different method. So we'd already have the radius of the star. Your delta F is what we've actually measured with the transit. So we've got that. We can then calculate the radius of the planet. So that's fairly straightforward to get. And once we have that, we can then get the volume. So that's that bit sorted. Now the next bit, we need to get the mass. Now to get the mass, we have to use the radial velocity method. And this is where you're looking at a Doppler shift of the host star. So we can't actually, again, get any measurements of the exoplanet itself directly, but we can measure the star. And the thing with this is the star and the exoplanet orbit a common center of mass. So don't think of it as the planet orbiting the star. They're both orbiting a common center of mass, the barycenter, but because the star is so much bigger, it's close to the star. So as we look at the star, it appears to wobble. It moves away from us and towards us. And we get a Doppler shift in that light that makes it to us. So if we're the observer, we're looking at it. You've got the star will be orbiting its common center of mass. And then the exoplanet does the same thing. We cannot measure the radius, or sorry, the radius, the, vol the velocity of the exoplanet, but we can measure the velocity of the star because that's what we can actually see. So we're going to measure that velocity of the star line of sight. The, we would call that the radial velocity by that Doppler shift. So what happens is as the star travels towards us, its light is slightly bluer. 
So it's blue shifted ever so slightly. When it travels away from us, it's slightly red shifted. So the star appears slightly redder. And we can measure that by looking how much it's actually shifted to what it would be normal if it was just static and still. So to get the actual velocity, we use this equation here. So this is your Doppler shift equation. Now your top one there, the shift in wavelength, that is how much the wavelength has actually shifted from its stationary wavelength. So for example, if we're looking at stars, we would normally use some of the hydrogen lines, maybe the H alpha line, which is about 656 nanometers. And that's what it is stationary. So that would be our wavelength on the bottom. And then the shift in wavelength will be how far it moves away from that. And then we can work out the actual velocity. And we would do that over time, multiple times. And then we would get a plot like this. This would be our radial velocity plot. So on the y-axis, you've got the radial velocity of the star, and then that is over time in the x-axis. And you can see you've got a nice kind of almost sine wave there. And you can see it moving away from us and then towards us. So we get that plot there. That tells us our radial velocity of the star. So once we have that, we can get the velocity of the star. We know the mass of the star, again, from some other method. But if the planet and the star have the same orbital period, which they do, because they're orbiting the barycenter, they both have the same period, they're just different distances, it means they're going to have the same momentum. So we don't know the right-hand side, the mass of the planet and the velocity of the planet, but we do know the left-hand side. So what we can do is we can rearrange that for the mass of the planet. So again, we have the mass of the star from another method, same as the radius really. We need to find the velocity of the planet now. So we've got the velocity of the star, that's what we've actually measured with this technique. So we need to find the orbital velocity of the exoplanet. Now we're going to make some assumptions that it's a circular orbit, and we can use Kepler's third law to find the semi-major axis A. So at the bottom one is the one we would probably use because we would take the cube root. So again, we've got the mass of the star, the only thing we need to pull out of our radial velocity plot at this point is P. Now that's the orbital period, and we know that the orbital period of the planet is the same as the orbital period of the star. So actually, that cycle we saw as it moved away from us and towards us, we can get the time between each peak or trough, and that's our orbital period. So we know that, so we can then calculate the semi-major axis of the planet. Now, once we've got that, we can then work out the velocity of the planet. So we've got P at the bottom. We've measured that from the actual plot. We've also got the semi-major axis, which is A. So we can get the circumference of the orbit. Again, this is making assumptions that it's a circular orbit, which is quite possible it's not. So therefore, we can get the orbital velocity because we know how long it takes to go around a certain circumference. So we can get the, the velocity there. Now there are a few ways to get the period, so I mentioned we can get it from the radial velocity plot, but you can get it from the transit. So if you watch the planet transit in front of the star, you get a dip, you wait for the next one. And the time period between those two dips is going to give you the orbital period. So the time between transits is also a way of getting your orbital period of the planet. But going back to the radial velocity plot, because the star and the planet share the same orbital period, then peak to peak is our orbital period when we're looking at the radial velocity of the star. So we can get it in both methods really. Now, now we actually have a minimum mass for the exoplanet. So we've got a, a mass. The reason being, we don't know the inclination of the, of the planet's orbit. So as we look at it, it could be slightly inclined, which means the line of sight of the radial velocity or the, the, the radial velocity we're picking up is not all in our direction. Some of it could be in a different direction. So we're only picking up some of it. So if you think about it like this here, that orbit is slightly inclined. It's never going to be absolutely perfectly edge on. So there's some inclination, which means we're not getting the true radial velocity as we measure it. So we, that's why it's referred to as the minimum mass, because we don't know I, the inclination. But we can rewrite the equation here for the mass of the planet. And typically, if you look at the mass of a planet when it's been calculated, it's likely going to be given a minimum mass in this form here. 
So we have the sine i, which is your inclination angle, which is something we don't know. So it's nearly always written as a minimum mass. However, if it is a transiting exoplanet, and we've done the radial velocity method, we likely will be able to get the inclination. So we have this b, which is called the impact parameter, and this is where the distance it actually travels across the star. So when a planet goes across the star, it can go across the centre, it can go across the edge, and depending on where it passes over, it changes the shape of the transit, which is the impact parameter. So we can get the inclination from the impact parameter. So just to visualise it a little bit better here, the planet can go across the centre, that would be an impact parameter of zero. If it's going across the outer edge, it's going to be an impact parameter of one. And we have an equation for that, so we can calculate what the impact parameter is, we can calculate i. What happens here is it actually changes the shape of the transit. So the transit can be more v-shaped as it goes towards the edge, and if it's across the centre, it's more of a U-shape. So it changes the shape. The reason being, the outer edge of the star is, is dimmer than the centre. So it blocks out less light towards the outer edge. It's actually transiting for a shorter period of time. So again, it became, becomes a little bit more of a V-shape than a U-shape. Changes the shape, changes the amount of light that's blocked out, changes the transit time as well. So we can calculate the inclination if we can find the impact parameter. So now we have everything we need. We have the mass and we have the radius, so we can then calculate the density of the planet. And again, not every exoplanet can have that density calculated because we can't always get a transit and the radial velocity method together to get the, this information really. But if we can, it can give you an enormous amount of information about the planet. It can tell you what type of planet it's likely is. So is it a rocky planet? Is it an ocean world? Is it more like a gas giant? So getting the density of the planet is very useful. But again, not every planet can have the density calculated due to the information you need to do that. So thank you for watching. And if you enjoy, then check out some of the other videos.